Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for this day of worship. Thank you because you have gathered us together for a good purpose. To prepare us for eternal fellowship with you. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your spirit will interpret your word to every one of us and bring us into proper, permanent fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, grant us the spirit of understanding. And we pray, O oh Lord, that all that needs to be done in every life will be done by your grace in your power, so that we will not lack anything you require of us in Jesus' name. Be with us, Lord. Do your will in every heart and every life. In Jesus' name we pray. In John chapter 17, just before Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for our sins, he gathered his disciples together, he looked up into heaven, and then he prayed for his own disciples. He had been teaching them and instructing them on the way they ought to go. And he had told them that life, in a way, is a preparation for eternity. And that we shall always think about our souls. In fact, on one occasion he told them, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and then loses his own soul? He made them to know the eternal value and importance of their soul. He had also told them about what it meant to be forgiven, not to have any guilt, condemnation upon them. He had forgiven them themselves, and he had seen him forgiving other people, and he had seen the grace of God flowing up from him to the vilest of sinners. And many times he had taught them and corrected them. And so what he saw in their lives that will not help them, assist them to spend eternity with a holy, pure, righteous God in heaven. Now, he wanted to make sure that they had that experience because he also believed in them. And he wanted them to qualify spiritually as they were examined, evaluated by the Father so that they will come to heaven and join him there and live eternally with him. That's the background of the prayer he prayed for his own disciples, St. John chapter 17. This prayer he prayed for his disciples, by the way you understand, it's a very special prayer. And it was a prayer that was a limited kind of prayer. He prayed the unlimited prayer on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. But then over here, he's praying a limited prayer, John chapter 17 verse 9. I pray for them, I pray not for the world. He was praying for a special blessing. He was praying for something very peculiar. Peculiar to the church. Peculiar to the believers. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them. Which thou hast given me. For they are thine. They had a special quality, qualification that they already belonged to the Lord. Their sins were forgiven. They were born again. They were members of the family of God. They were in Christ, new creatures. And because of that, they had a special place in his heart. Then he said in verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. He was uh, leaving the world and he knew that the world was evil and he wanted Father to keep them away from the evil in the world. But then he extended the prayer a little. He extended the prayer in verse 20 and he said, Neither pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He said, When that time comes, they begin to preach, and then other people are one to the Lord, and they become believers. Those believers too, this prayer will affect them. This prayer will be theirs. What was the real central point of the prayer? In verse 17, sanctify them. He was praying to the Father that the Lord will do something necessary so that their lives will be what the, the lives ought to be. And so that the experiences will be what the experiences ought to be. I'm talking to you today on the sanctification of true believers. Sanctification of true believers. The doctrine of entire sanctification for believers, uh, that is, believers, those already born again. This doctrine is clearly taught in the scriptures. But please understand, these people that Jesus Christ was praying for, they were already born again. In verse 3, it says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He said that they will know you, the only true God. And then he said that they will know Jesus Christ too, whom he hath sent. 
The question is, these people now that Jesus Christ was praying for, did they know the Lord? Yes, they knew. They knew that Jesus Christ was the very Son of God. One of them confessed, we know who thou art. Thou art the Son of the living God, and Jesus said, flesh and blood hath not revealed that unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. In verse 6, I've manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. It says, they are not of the world anymore. You've given them to me out of the world. You've selected them, and you have cleansed them, and you have made them different from the world. It says, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. They have kept thy word. Which means then, that they were not like the people of the world. These ones were born again. In fact, he distinguished them. He made a difference between them and the people of the world when he said in verse 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. I'm praying for them, they're different from the world. I'm praying for them, they are selected, taken out of the world. I'm praying for them, they are no more of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then in verse 11, he says, and now I'm coming. Now I am no more in the world. And, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, for they, that they may be one as we are. He begins to tell us more about uh, the, their spiritual experiences in verse 14. I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them. And he told them the reason the world has hated them. He had told them earlier in chapter 15. In chapter 15 verse 18. It says, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were the world, the world will love its own. He was telling them very clearly. I know what has happened to you. I know I'm taking you out of the world. I know you are not of the world. Even the people of the world, they know you are not for them. Because if you are of the world, the world will have loved the son. But because ye are not of the world, and I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And then he tells them now, he tells the father now, in 17 verse 14, I've given them your word. The world has hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. In verse 16, he repeats it again. They are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. These were the people then that Jesus prayed for. That they will be sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? Number one, it means to be made holy. Something was crooked. Straighten it out. Something was polluted. Cleanse it up. Something was dirty. You make it pure. And it's, it's to make holy. And then it's to be cleansed from moral corruption. Any internal corruption, inward corruption, in the mind, in the thought, in the heart, in the spirit, in the personality, personality within, the Lord cleanses everything. It is to be made free from inward, inbred sin. The sin that is attached to us internally. The sin that we came into the world with. It is to free us from that sin. It is to be set apart entirely for God, for God's glory, for God's work, for God's honor. And when we are sanctified, Jesus Christ, he made it known what will happen to the disciples. In fact, he says, how the people of the world will know that they were sanctified in verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He said, Father, I want you to sanctify them because I want them to be one. You say, were they not one? No, they were not one. You can be living under the same roof and not be one. You can be worshipping the same church and not be one. You can be following the same master and not be one. Many times they argued between them. Who shall be the greatest? They were not one. Many times there were disagreements, discord among them. They were not one. And Jesus knew that. He said, Father, sanctify them. If you sanctify them, they'll walk the same direction. They'll speak the same thing. They'll, they'll think the same way. And they will uplift the same thing. And they'll be, they'll be thinking one about the other. Sanctify them, Father, because I'll not be with them again. If this kind of disagreement comes up again and blows them apart, then what will become of the church? Then it says, the people of the world will not be able to believe that thou hast sent me, but Father, I'm praying for them, that you will sanctify them, that they all may be one. As thou Father art in me and I in thee. And it's then, when they are one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In verse 23, I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. 
not just that they are loosely united together, they are perfectly united together, that the world may know that thou hast sent me as, and hast loved them even as thou hast loved me. As we talk about this sanctification of true believers, there are three things we need to know. Number one, the problem of sin. The problem of sin. In fact, that's the great problem that brought Jesus Christ into the world. That's the great problem that made Jesus Christ to go through indescribable suffering. In fact, that's the problem that made him to agonize. And then to drink that cup, that cup so bitter that he said, Father, if days could have passed over me, but not my will, but as I willed. That's the agony that he had on the cross when he shouted and cried, Father, Father, my God, my God, why hast thou for- forsaken me? It's a problem of sin. But you need to understand, as we talk about sanctification, there are two major experiences, very important, very essential. Number one, salvation. Number two, sanctification. And those two experiences are dealing with the problem of sin. One, uh, there is the external sin, outward sin, committed sin. Salvation deals with that. Two, there is the inward sin, internal sin, inbred sin, inherited sin. Sanctification deals with that. When you first come to the Lord, what you realize is that you have committed sin. What you realize is that your hands are dirty. Your language is dirty. Your appearance is immoral. It's not acceptable in the sight of the Lord. And because of that, you are praying for forgiveness. You are praying for the cleansing of those sins. You are dealing with the first problem of sin. And that is the external, outward, a committed sins which you have done. That's what uh, this man David was praying for in uh, Psalm 51. Psalm 51, reading from verse 1. He said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. You'll see that it says, my transgressions. It says, I know I've transgressed. I know that I've crossed the line. When you use the word trans before any other thing you join to it, it means you cross. You talk about transatlantic. Atlantic, you cross over the Atlantic. And you talk of transformation. Uh, you form something, you, trans, uh, you, you transform. You cause from one form to the other. When you talk of transgression, it means that you have overstepped the boundaries that the Lord set for you. You have done against, somewhat against, the thus saith the Lord. And you will see that the transgressions there, they are in the plural. And in many parts of scripture, we are told it may be fornication or wickedness. It may be covetousness or maliciousness. It may be envy or murder. It may be debate, division, deceit, malignity, or whispering. It may be backbiting. It may be that you are despiteful, you are proud, you are boasting, you are inventors of evil things. It may be that you are disobedient to parents. Transgressions. Those are the things that people do that they overstay the boundary that the Lord has made for them. Put it this way. It's like when you came to this world, God placed you down. And then he drew a circle around you. And he said, remain in that circle will be in fellowship. Remain in that circle will be in talking terms. Remain inside that circle and my blessing will be pouring down upon you. And you looked around and you felt you are wiser than God. And you said, this circle is too small. I cannot remain inside this circle. And you see the chalk line that the Lord has drawn around you. And then you overstep the boundary of that line. You cross to the outside of the circle. That's transgression. The Lord made a circle around you with his commandments. And that circle, you overstepped that circle. When you committed fornication, that's what you did. You overstepped the, the circle. When you committed adultery, and when you uh, worshipped idols, when you became effeminate, when you became sissy, when you as a man, you dressed like a woman. And when you as a woman, you dressed like a man, or when you stole, when you became covetous, or when you became a drunkard, when you reviled the people that were good, when you cheated the people in your place of work, and you were overstepping the boundary. And because you overstepped the boundary, the Bible says, that's transgression. You have trespassed. And then David realized, although he was king, he had trespassed the way of the Lord and the word of the Lord. He wanted the first part of sin to be dealt with in his life. That's why I said, I need mercy. If you want to deal with me on the basis of merit, I'll perish. 
If you were to deal with me on the basis of marriage, on the basis of righteousness, if you were to mark my life against your standard, I will not match up because I see the circle. I've left the circle behind and I've overstepped the circle that you drew for me. I know I've transgressed. He said in uh, Psalm 51, verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sins. I acknowledge my transgressions and the plural, my sin is ever before me against thee, the only in verse 4. Have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judges and then he goes on and on you see the point there there is the one side of sin that one side of sin is the iniquity that people do it's a sin that people commit it's the transgressions or the trespasses that people get into in fact it was like that in the antediluvian age and that means just before the flood in genesis chapter 6 reading there from verse 5 genesis chapter 6 verse 5 and God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of, of the heart of his heart was only evil continually. And you will see there very clearly, it talks about the evil things that he did. It calls it wickedness. The thing they did to hurt other people, to destroy other people, or to hurt uh, the, the mind of God, because he created them holy and pure. And yet they will not remain in that purity and holiness. But then you will see, there's a second part to it. It not goes inward. It goes internal. It talks about the inbred sin, internal sin that we're talking about. It says, every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil and that continually. It says there's something in the heart. And it's the propensity for evil. It's the leaning towards evil. It's uh, uh, the, the wanting to, the desire to do evil. Even when the evil has not been done, the desire is there. The thought is there. The plan is there. The longing is there. It's seated right there in the heart. And it's a thing that makes a person want to do his own will. Away from the will of God. Away from obedience to the watch of God. For young people to understand... It's like uh, when you have a dirty pond uh, around your house. And that dirty pond is filled with all sorts of germs. And it's very, very dirty. If your handkerchief fell into that pond, you don't even want to take it up and wash it again. If uh, your clothes uh, fell into that pond, you don't want to take uh, that uh, uh, clothes and wash it again. Because you think nothing, no detergent will be able to wash this and make it clean. Because the pond is very dirty, unfortunately. It may be your junior sister fell into that pond and uh, you shouted and then before she actually went down uh, before she drowned somebody came and got her up and looking at her the air the nose and the clothes everywhere completely dirty and eventually they take something and they clean her up and then because of a little child you are rejoicing and say thank god uh, my junior sister is okay now clean now and then your daddy your mommy they say that's even a minor problem because the dirty water has gotten inside of her now we've cleansed on the outside the internal part needs to be cleansed and then they discover they could not do that themselves and they had to get a specialist a doctor in to be able to pump that thing out and do a kind of cleansing internally and then she suffered a little while before she was all right the outward cleansing was salvation it's a picture of salvation. All the outward pollution that we act on us, on our character, on our morality, on our personality. All the things we did that other people saw, other people knew, and they knew that this could not be right. When we are forgiven, when we are cleansed, that's salvation. And then you are saying, praise the Lord, that fellow is saved, that fellow is born again. Things are different now. And Jesus said, yes, things are different outwardly. But you need to think, you need to know his thoughts. You, know, you need to know the desires in his heart. You need to know the things that are uh, uh, turning up in his heart. You need to know the secret plans and the secret things that men do not see. That needs to be dealt with yet so that he'll be completely alright in the sight of God. That's about sanctification in uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, reading there from verse 25. Then will I cleanse, will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. That's outward. That's salvation. 
Let's talk about the things that you have done. And from all your filthiness and from all your idols, will I cleanse you? That's an experience that is the forgiveness of sin. There's an experience. It is salvation. There is an experience. It's been born again. There's an experience of coming to Christ. All things are passed away. That's external things. That's uh, the, the outward things that you have done. All those sins, transgressions, trespasses you committed, everything is taken away. That's salvation. But the Lord said, that's not enough. But the Lord said, that's not the end. But the Lord said, that will not make a person to be entirely how the Lord wants him to be. But the Lord said, that is not all that Jesus Christ came to die for. There, you have a double problem, and you need a double cure. You have an outward problem, an inward problem. You need an outward solution, an inward solution. Now in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you an heart of flesh. He was talking to some people. He said, your problems are not completely solved in verse 25. When you are cleansed and forgiven and saved and born again. He said, you still need a second touch. And you still need a second cleansing. And you still need a second transformation. And you still need a second work of grace. And that, he said, he will do. Do you understand? It says in verse 25, I will do this. I will cleanse you. Salvation is the work of the Lord. Do you understand? In verse 26, I will give you another heart in your spirit. Will I put within you? Sanctification is a work of God as well. It's not something you do by yourself. It is what the Lord himself does. And then he says, I'm taking away the stony heart. I'm taking away the stubborn heart. I'm taking away the rebellious heart. I'm taking away that sin within that will not allow a man to be swallowed up, to be submissive completely and entirely into the will of God in the hand of God. And then he says, I will give you an heart of flesh. You illustrate it in other ways, like when you see a tree. And that tree is growing and having branches and having fruits. And then you decide that that tree should not be there again. And therefore what you did was to cut down the tree. The branches are off, the fruits are off, and you sweep around that place, and you clean everything. And then somebody says, how clear the place is. Look at the fresh air that is blowing all around now. And then the rainy season comes. And then it begins to budge again. And if you look away from that thing, and you neglect it, another rainy season will come, another rainy season will come, and then you find in a couple of years that the branches are up again. And the fruits are up again. Why? Because you did a one part job. Out of the job that has two parts. When you cut down the branches, you still have not finished your work. You, you take something and dig it up and remove the roots of the tree. If you do not want the tree to bud again, to be there again. In Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14. I'm reading there from verse 7. It says, for there is hope of a tree. If, the, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground. Yet, through the scent of water, it will burn and bring forth boughs like a plant. It's telling you that when you have cut down the tree, it's telling you that when the branches are off, it's telling you that when the fruits are off, it's telling you that when you are born again, and the transgressions are taken away, and the trespasses are forgiven, and then you say externally, outwardly, my language has changed, my life has changed, my character has changed, everything has changed in me. You said, no, it's not enough. You must still move on, and then you'll be sanctified so that the root of the problem will be taken away, and the root will not be there again. In Hebrews chapter 12, reading there in verse 15. After you are born again, to seek the face of the Lord and be really sanctified. That, that leads me to point number two, the promise of sanctification. The promise of sanctification. And the Lord from the early time promised to some people, he, he had always known our need. He had always known what will qualify us to be in fellowship with him and to live eternally with him. And that's why he had made the promise even long, long ago. Since the time in memorial, he had made the promise and he had given the commands and the challenge. Don't you remember? After uh, Abraham knew the Lord, the Lord gave him a challenge. He said, Abraham, 
And Abraham was a person that already knew the Lord. Abraham was a person that in an earlier chapter had prayed for Abimelech. And the Lord answered because Abraham had relationship with God. But then God said, Abraham, at what says are all? The lion is up. The idol worship is up. And all your old life, when I took you from the old, the Chaldees, all that is gone. But Abraham, you know what I'm telling you now? Walk before me and be thou perfect. You see, there was a second thing the Lord wanted. A second work of grace. He wanted done in his life. And in line with his demand, in line with his command, he has also given the promise. The promise of sanctification. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading there in verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading in verse 6. And the Lord thy God. How does the Lord become the Lord thy God? How does the Lord become a a person that is rightly related to you? When your sins are forgiven, the Lord thy God. When your sins are taken away, the Lord thy God. When the Lord had broken the chains of Egypt away from you, the Lord thy God. When the Lord had passed you through the Red Sea, a symbol of your water baptism, the Lord thy God. When the Lord has given you commandments and you are taking the manna every day, every morning, the Lord thy God. When you can say, thank God we are not like the Egyptians. We came out of Egypt, but we are not in Canaan yet. The Lord thy God. They were born again in the language of the New Testament. They were forgiven in the language of the New Testament. Something had happened to them in the language of the New Testament. Now it's the Lord thy God. But it's something he has not done which he will do. You have got salvation, that's a past experience now. But you have not got sanctification, that's a future experience at the point Moses was talking to them. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. It's an internal thing. He will circumcise your heart and the heart of thy seed. That means when those children are born, they will need sanctification too. Of course, they will need false salvation. That you are born of sanctified parents does not mean that you will not need your own experience. That you are born of a graduate parent does not mean you will not need to go to school by yourself. That you are born of healthy parents does not mean that you have to possess your own health yourself. That you are born of a talented prince, highly placed uh, parents does not mean that uh, you'll be high and you'll be on top every time. It has to be a personal experience for you. It says, he'll circumcise your heart. He'll sanctify you. He'll take the Adamic nature away. He will do it for your seed as well. And then when he has done it, what will happen? That you will love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all thy soul, with that thou mayest live. He said, when that heart is circumcised. He said, when that Adamic nature is circumcised. He will fulfill that promise and he will make you to love the Lord your God. And then he says, with all your heart. Oh, you say, when I'm born again, I already love the Lord. Yes, you love the Lord. You love yourself too. You love the Lord. You love some money too. You love the Lord and you love some property material things too. You love the Lord, you love your own comfort too. You love the Lord, you love a lot of other things too, even though you know the Lord. That's why when the Lord says, do this, do this, do that, you think about yourself. How does the sin affect me? But then he says, something is going to be done that will give you a perfect love, complete love, entire love. That now you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That thou mayest live is the experience of sanctification the Lord was talking about. And he made the promise. By the way, when God makes a promise, does he fulfill the promise? Yes, he does. Us because we're told in Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23, there in verse 19. Here we're told of the promise of the very fact that God will never deny himself. God is not a man that he shall lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. As he said, and shall he not do it? As he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Did he say he will sanctify and then shall he not actually do it? Oh yes, he said that he will do it. Because when he makes a promise, he actually fulfills the promise. The word tells us he watches over his word to fulfill the word. In First Kings chapter 8 verse 56. First Kings chapter 8 verse 56. Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there has not failed one word of all his good promise. There has not failed one word of all his good promise. We understand then that this sanctification is not something that we struggle personally. In fact, the more you struggle, the more you miss it. Because in struggling, you are pushing the Lord aside. You are saying, I am saved by grace, I want to be sanctified by works. 
You say, I'm saved by Christ, but I want to be sanctified by self. And the Lord has done a lot for me and saved me and removed my sin. But this inbred nature in what sin? Internal sin? Inherited sin? I want to deal with it myself. No, you cannot. The Lord knew that you cannot. That's why he gave the promise. And he said, I am the one to do it. Come back again to Ezekiel. Ezekiel tells us that this is a thing that the Lord himself will do. It's a thing he has promised to do. It's a thing he delights to do. That this removal of the inbred sin. In what sin? He does it for the people that actually want it to be done for them. The people that know the essence, the importance, the indispensability of the experience. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. I will give them an heart of flesh. It must be a real thing, and you must see how the Lord was saying, I'm going to take it away from them, the stony heart, the stony heart, the stony heart. What's the stony heart? If you want to understand the stony heart, look at the lives of the children of Israel. Rise up, they sat down, sit down, they rose up, go and possess Canaan, no we can't do it. The giants are there. Alright, don't go anymore. And then they put Ernest armor on. They want to go. They want to go and fight. When the Lord says don't go, that's when they want to go. And when the Lord said go, that's the time they do not want to go. You will collect uh, two measures on, uh, on Friday. And then on the Sabbath day, nobody will go out because I've given you double measure so that you can have extra for the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day, they went out wanting to see if they could see something to collect. That's a stony heart. And every time there was no water, every time there was a little inconvenience, murmuring and complaining. In fact, sometimes uh, uh, Moses said they'd be ready to stone us. That's a stony heart that murmurs, that grumbles, that will not stay quiet and restful and peaceful in the will of God. But then the Lord said, that's not a good relationship. That's not a good state of mind. And that's not the perfect experience I want for my children. Therefore, what I have not done for them, I'm going to do for them. He says, I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within them. And I will take the stony heart, the rebellious heart, the stubborn heart, out of their flesh. And I will give them the heart of flesh. It's the sanctification that the Lord promised. And it is the holiness that the Lord himself promised his own people. In Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 72. From verse 72, it says, To obtain, to perform the mercy promised to our Father, and to remember His holy covenant and the oath, which is war unto our Father Abraham, that He will grant us that we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve Him without fear. He knew that they were serving Him, but many times they were serving Him with fear. Can He provide bread for us? Can He provide enough water for us to drink? And he wants to take us to the land of Canaan. Will he make a, 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 will he make a provision for our children? And uh, don't carry us away from there, from here. It's okay for us men to go and face the uncertainty of the future. Let our families stay behind here. Can you do this? Can you do this? And they were serving the Lord with fear. And the fear of material things, the fear of possession, the fear of marriage, the fear of children, the fear of if I stay with the gospel alone, if I stay with the teaching alone, if I stay in the church alone, will the Lord provide for all my needs? We will serve him without fear. Not only that, it says we will serve him without the fear of the Philistines. Every time some of those uh, Israelites in their various generations, they were under the fear of the Philistines. He said you will serve him without fear. He saves us. Yes, the Philistines were there. But the promise he gave is that when you are saved, it will be serving the Lord without fear. The Philistines for us today may be the witches and the wizards. The Philistines today may be the adversaries and the enemies. And there are people that are looking here here and there, and see if, you know, in the night, enemies are there, in the day, enemies are there, when the wind blows, uh, demons uh, are moving, and when the tree is shaking, demons are moving, and when something is uh, making uh, maybe expansion noise in the ceiling, demons are operating there, and when there is uh, water running in the closet, demons have come, then they serve you with fear. And it says when you are born again, and Christ is on the throne of your heart, and you are following after Christ, you will serve him without fear. But you know there are people that are here on Sunday, and then on Monday, uh, they are in the valley, on Tuesday, they are in the mountain, and they are here, they are in the shed. On the other place, they are almost burning candle. In the other place, they are drinking water. In the other place, they are bathing with uh, holy water. Why are they doing that? There is fear. 
There is fear of the future. There is fear of the enemy. It says when you are born again, he makes you to serve the Lord without fear. Some people even fear believers. Some people even fear the church. Some people even fear their leaders. Some people fear, they see witches everywhere. You serve the Lord without fear. When you are born again, throughout the born again, and you are in Christ, you serve the Lord without fear. But that's not enough. He tells us something else in verse 75. In holiness and righteousness before him. All the days of our life. It says, I'm, I'm going to do this for you. One, you'll be born again. One, your life will be totally changed. And then, you'll serve the Lord without fear. And then, that's not the end. I'm going to do something for you that you'll be in holiness and in righteousness. Not just on Sunday. Not just on Monday. Not just on Thursday. Not just in the workers' meeting time. It is all the days of your life. And who does that? Christ does that. By the cleansing of his blood. In Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, where for Jesus also, that he might sanctify, that he might purify the people with his own blood, is suffered without the gate. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, is suffered without the gate. That's what God did for men of old. That's what God did for the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he can do for us. Because what God did before, can he do it again? I say, can he do it again? He can do it for you and for me. And then we we'll serve the Lord without fear. Peace of mind, rest in your soul. Following after the Lord in the night and the day, you are following after the Lord. And you are in holiness and righteousness, no matter the temptation, no matter the trial, no matter what may surround you. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 26, there, chapter 19, verse 26. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Here the Lord is telling us that what men may find difficult, God finds possible. He tells us, but Jesus beheld them. And he said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, I said with God, all things are possible. He can save the vilest of sinners. And he can sanctify uh, the, 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 the hardest person, the most stubborn of all people. He can sanctify. Because what looks impossible for man is possible with God. Number one, we're seeing the problem of sin. It's double-fold. The cure, the solution is double-fold. And then we're seeing the promise of sanctification. It is not what man can do alone by himself. It is what God himself will do and it will do for you if you will call upon the Lord and when you have got it, you can make it permanent in your life should in case you, you are not thinking that you have need of this experience you look at your life, you think everything is alright, I am doing well and in fact I'm so different from what I used to be that every time I wake up now and I look at myself and I look at the temptations I overcome and I look at the victory in my life I'm praising the Lord, yes you are praising the Lord but have you forgotten that you may be doing right outwardly but inwardly inwardly, inwardly you are not exactly like you ought to be like God desires and delights in in second chronicles chapter 25 second chronicles chapter 25 reading from verse 2 and he did he did that which was right in the sight of the lord that's why many people stop i'm doing that which is right in the sight of the lord I've never gone through any discipline in the church. In my place of work, they have never issued a query to me. In my family, my wife, my husband can bear testimony. In our family, my parents can bear testimony. They know that something happened to me. A change has come upon me. And the people I interact with in the church, they can tell how by the grace of God, in fact, many of them are praying that they will be like me. That's not enough, my brother, my sister. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Look at the end of the verse. But not with a perfect heart. That's a sanctification. When you do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, you are born again. You are saved. You are right. You are righteous. You are upright. But then the Lord is saying, go beyond that. I want something deeper, something greater, something higher than that. I want you to do even that which is right with a perfect heart, a perfect attitude, a perfect spirit, a perfect everything around you, everything within you, perfection. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That's why we're talking about point number three, the prayer for sanctification. The prayer for sanctification. In uh, Ezekiel again, 
chapter 36, it's in Ezekiel we read before, and it's in this chapter 36 we read before, where it says he'll give us a new heart. Where it says he'll put, he'll take away the stony heart out of our flesh and give us the heart of flesh. It's in that chapter now, it's telling us in verse 37. Then says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. It says, yes, I want to do it. It's like he wants to save the world, but the world is not all saved. It's like he wants everybody to be born again. He doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked. And he's not willing that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why hasn't everybody come to repentance? Why is everybody not born again? Why is everybody not having the new life? Because they didn't pray for it. They didn't ask. Maybe many people that even have been coming to church for a long time, they knew about being born again. They have not asked. That's why they are not saved. And when you are saved, and then the Lord said, I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to purify you. He says, yet for this you must inquire of me. You must ask. And you must desire. You must punch after it. You must want it beyond everything else. It's when your ass will do it for you. In Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Reading there in verse 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Uh, the, the promises of the Lord, the gifts of the Lord are not cheap. They are not something that will just fall upon you without the desire, without the consecration, without the passionate desire, running after God, wanting what God has for you. They are not things that will jump on you while you are just walking on the road. They are not something that will come on you, just fall on you because you attend church service. If your mind is not there, if your heart is not there, if your desire is not there, if you are not passionate about it, if you do not examine yourself, if you do not look up to heaven, if you don't look at the cross where Jesus died and bled for you, if you do not ask for the second cleansing, purifying of the blood of the Lamb upon your heart, upon your soul, if you are not asking for this experience of a sanctification, you read the life of Enoch and it doesn't move you, it doesn't bother you, it doesn't challenge you, you're not going to just have the experience of Enoch without designing it. You look at the life of Samuel from his young age until he became much, much older. And yet he doesn't challenge you. He doesn't move you. He doesn't create a thirst in you. You're not just going to have sanctification just because you are coming to a church that preaches sanctification. Reading about it is not enough. Knowing about it is not enough. Hearing about it is not enough. Even believing it as a doctrine is not enough. Even knowing the scriptures where you can find them is not enough. Even that other people are sanctified and encouraging you, that's not enough. Ask and it shall be given you. And the Lord told, the Lord told Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. The Lord did not make him perfect without his desire. Without his consecration, without his asking for it, without his panting after it, without his elevating it, exalting it above every other thing in his life. He said, that's what I want. All the other things, I push them aside. That's how we get sanctified. We don't get sanctified because I had that before. My friend, you had that before. Did you pray? Uh, we had it in the workers' retreat. Yes, we did. Have you got it? It says, ask, and it shall be given you seek, and you shall find. When you're seeking for something, you may not find it five minutes after you start searching, after you start seeking, but then uh, your mind is confused. And your mind is on that thing. And you cannot concentrate on any other thing. You say, this is very important for me. Where did I drop that thing? Where did I miss that thing? And you are searching and you are seeking and you are looking. And you turn up everything. And you, you look into every box. You look into every drawer. You look into every available space. Isn't that what we do? We go to the Lord. We are seeking for sanctification. We look at our motives. Lord, what's denying me? This sanctification, is it because of this? And you look at the other box of your love, of your attitude, of your relationship, of your interaction, of your actions uh, to your fellow brothers and sisters in the district or in the zone, or to the unbelievers in the place of work, or to your wife in the home, or to your husband in the home, you're searching. And then after you've searched all that, you say, Lord, I want to be sanctified, and yet sanctification has not come, and you're still seeking. Is it because I'm neglecting evangelism? Is it because I'm not seeking after the way of the Lord and the work of the Lord? Is it because I'm not paying my tithe. Is it because of this? You are searching. Searching everywhere. You say, Lord, I'm searching. I don't know where. I dropped this in. I don't know why. I'm missing this thing. Then you throw yourself on the altar of the Lord. You say, Lord, get everything of me. Everything of me. My heart, 
my past, my future, my personality, everything. And anything you want to do, do in my life. I'm going to be at the center of the will of God. And he says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Isn't that what he wants us to do? So we can get sanctified. It's not just to hear the word. It's not just to make sure that I know all the references. I know all the passages. Old Testament, New Testament, New Covenant, Old Covenant. And the blood of Jesus can do it. He's prayed for it. He's done it for other people. He even did it for me before. Although I know the condition of my heart now. Yet it doesn't matter. I buy and buy. It will, it will come again. Uh, when I got it the first time, I didn't uh, take too much trouble. Now this time, it will come when it, when it will. No, it will not come when it will. You must ask. You must seek. And you must knock. And then he tells us that for everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. That's what the Lord is saying. He tells us in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It says the hunger will be there. The desire, you know, when you are hungry, you can't concentrate on any other thing. That's what it says. You know you are hungry for sanctification. And when you are really hungry for this sanctification and holiness, every other thing will not amount to anything before you. You are so hungry for it. You are so desirous of it. Even religious activities will not matter at all. Because you want the sanctification, the righteousness to fill your personality. And then it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's the important thing that the Lord is asking us that you, you will seek after. You will run after. You will pant after. And your mind and your heart will be after. Well, we're so passionate about it, desirous about it, consecrating everything entirely to the Lord. Well, the reason is because we don't know when the trumpet will sound. We don't know when death will call. We don't know when we're going to leave this world. And when we leave this world and we're going to be in the great beyond, there is one ticket, there is one visa the Lord will be looking for. He'll be looking, number one, are we saved? And if we're saved, are we done things worthy of repentance? Are we bearing fruit that uh, are suitable uh, for repentance? For those who have repented, have we done a restitution? Are we living pure lives outwardly, holy lives outwardly? Are we living lives that even the unbelievers around us, they will be bearing testimony more than that? Our conscience will be bearing us witness. We are walking in the light as he is in the light. We don't know when death will call. Uh, there are people that were here last year and they are no more here now this year. They have gone to the great beyond and they have gone to meet the Lord and they have now received the reward of uh, what they made of the worship when they were in the world here. But then salvation alone is not enough. The Lord himself said that uh, judgment will begin at the house of God and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that will be not the gospel of Christ? And then it says that the righteous be scarcely saved. Where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? You are asking the Lord, am I really ready for the great beyond? Am I sanctified? Am I purified? Is there a stain? Is there a blemish? Is there a blot in my life that when I close my eyes in death and I'm daring to pass to the great beyond, there will be something pulling me back and then I look back and say what's that pulling me back I want to go to heaven I'm a child of God I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. I serve the Lord I'm a member of deeper life not shallow church I'm a member of the people that are deep in the Bible and deep in experience and the thing keeps on pulling you back and you look back like this and it's the inbred sin is the inward nature, is a selfish motive, is a thing that is planted in the heart that they, you didn't allow the Lord to remove. That's why David, uh, David became serious now. He looked away from the throne. He looked away from all the privileges of the throne of being a king over Israel, the greatest nation on the earth. And then he, on the apex of that greatest nation, he said, that will not get me to heaven. He said, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place. He that has clean hands, are your hands clean? With the stealing, with the pilfering, with the taking of church money, with the changing of receipts, with the dubious act, fraudulent act in the bank where you work, and with all the things you do, and you women hiding the money of your husband, I'll go and do this with it. Are your hands clean or sticky? What money? Are your hands clean? Rubbing it on those ladies, on the mage, and all that. Are your hands clean? He that has clean hands doesn't stop there. And a pure heart. And a pure heart. Lord, wash me within, without, 
either by fire or by the blood. Just make me clean. Clean within. Clean without. Until you will look with the microscope of heaven. And look at my heart. And look at my spirit. And look at my nature. And look at the very depths of my thought. And you will not see a stain, a blemish. And you will not see anything. I don't want to come to church in vain. I don't want to play religion. Lord, make me clean. Within, without. Make me pure within, without. Wash me thoroughly with his soap or the blood of the Lamb. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my motive. Cleanse my spirit. All the inward things within me cleanse everything. Am I ready for heaven? Am I as pure as Enoch? Am I as pure as Daniel? Am I as pure as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Am I as pure as Zechariah? Am I as pure as John the Beloved? Am I as pure as Paul? Am I as pure as Jesus? Am I as perfect as my Heavenly Father? The blood of Jesus can do it this morning. If you will call upon the Lord and tell Him, cleanse me, wash me. What the eyes of man cannot see, the eyes of God can see. He sees us in the secret place. He sees us in the open place. He sees us in the family. He sees us when the family members are not there. He sees us when we steal money. He sees us if our hands are not clean. He sees us if our hearts are not pure. He sees the imagination of the heart. He sees the desires of the heart. He sees all the, Im- all the machinations, all the desires, all the propensities, all the motives, everything that is there. He sees everything through and through. When the trumpet shall sound and Christ shall come. And the Lord shall examine every man. And he will look into all the activities. And he will look into all the attitudes. And he will look into the hands and to the heart. And he will look at everything within and without. Will he find you ready? Will he find you pure? Will he find you holy? Will he find you that you have that holiness? Holiness in church. Holiness on the street. Holiness in the home. Holiness in the place of work. Holiness for the believers. Holiness for the unbelievers. Holiness everywhere. Holiness when you are with the men. Holiness when you are with the women. Holiness when you are with those girls, teenage girls. Holiness when you are everywhere. Holiness with, uh, before him. All the days of our life. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. 